It's time for the world's greatest wrestling podcast on earth. I don't care if you listen to anything else. This is the world's greatest wrestling podcast with the with the greatest sports entertainer podcast of, now, of them all, Lars Fredrickson. I fucking hate sports entertainment, first of all. <laughs> that's fucking, that's, uh, you know what? You should be, you should get your walking papers for that intro. <laughs> I thought you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, we got fucking Eddie Kingston on the show here, a professional wrestler. Okay, not a sports <laughs> entertainer. You know, I, I mean, wouldn't this even guy... call myself a pro wrestler. I just consider myself a fighter. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's fair, but I mean, I'm right now. My my my, I'm honing on Dennis. I'm right, gonna uh, hone in on the pro wrestler part. How dare you, Dennis? Yeah, yeah. See, there you go. So, um, yes. Hi, Dennis. Listen, what it... I'm excited. This is this is a guy that we both have slight connections to, and I was kind of refreshing Eddie's mind about how him and I almost did a podcast together. But the the week him and I were going to get together, I got I got started getting divorced, and it messed with my mental health, and which was kind of kind of. So, are you my... blaming Eddie for your divorce? Is that yeah, what that's where I was going see? with this whole he thing. He wouldn't be the first person to blame me for that, by the way. Yeah, I'm not gonna where... I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, but isn't it obvious <laughs> where I was going with this story, guys? I was going to play the victim. Yeah. I but, got a lot of friends who blame me for the, them yeah. breaking up with their girlfriends because their girlfriends couldn't stand me. And I'm like, well, the girl wasn't good to you anyway. Exactly. Exactly. But so I was kind of refreshing his memory that uh, I was that close in the mental health. And I was doing a, a, a podcast with Eli Drake at the time. And then I stopped doing that. And it was like a year before it, the, right around the time, Lars, you and I started doing the podcast with that cast and crew that we used to. But I was talking to Eddie, and it kind of wanted to go into my first question, which we're going to skip all the introductions because it's AEW superstar, which must sound. Oh, amazing. I hate that word superstar. I hate that word superstar. See, but see how he's fucking. See how he's sports. No, you know what? No, right I, I get it. I get why he says superstar because that's been beat into our heads. But when I was a kid growing up, like we didn't call Dusty Rhodes or Ric Flair or. Anybody in the NWA or WCW at the time, or even ECW superstars, you know what I mean? Can, can I get a mulligan? Can I do this one more time? You yes. can do whatever you need, brother. I don't right. care. All whatever right. Law says, he said, go ahead, man. Take two. We're here with <laughs> AEW personality. And there you go. What the fuck is that? What, is he going to roll out on the red carpet next? You know, or Eddie like, Kingston. Like a special Oscars. appearance at or the Dennis. Oscars. Or hey, Dennis. A, a little yes. behind us, you know, Okay, bad. Let, let, let me let me let me help you out. Okay. Right now we got one badass motherfucker, a hell of a talent, a 100% pure fighter, professional wrestler, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Eddie Kingston. Wait, wait. Let me roll this back because uh you know, they won't see it at home, but uh you know, AEW is kind enough to set up this interview and uh, Danny wanted me to call him television heartthrob Eddie Kingston. Oh. I like that. Yeah, nah. That's not, I've never been called that in my life. I have, I I've hung out with, you know what I mean? I hung out with the dudes in the neighborhood who were considered pretty boys so I could pick up their scraps after the ball. But I was never the pretty boy type. Fair enough. <laughs> well, let, let's jump into my first question, question, which was I was setting up like 20 minutes ago, which was the mental health aspect where I feel like in a industry full of macho men who don't really want to open up about their feelings – and, you know, I had to come into Jesus and I had PD Williams to talk to me at the time and help me through my issues. When did you realize, because I feel like it, it may have started three or four years ago for you, where you were more vocal than anybody else in the wrestling industry about the mental health, health aspect. When and how did you kind of get to that point where you can openly talk about it in that industry? Uh, it, it honestly, it had to happen when uh, a close friend of mine, uh, Larry Sweeney passed away when he committed suicide and I just had enough. You know what I mean? I had, an, I had enough of us not talking about it. I had enough of people pulling me to the side and be like, hey, Eddie, you know, I go through this and that. And I'm like, yeah, okay, tell people about it. And they wouldn't do it. And then next thing you know, they not saying act up, but they're dealing with their demons. And by mistake, they throw that energy off to someone else in a negative manner and then they're in trouble. And I'm like, I do that. I did that for 18 years in wrestling. You know what I mean? So I was like, we got to start talking about it now. We got to be open about it because 
not being open about it. We used to do that in the past and we've lost a lot of good people either from suicide or ODs because they couldn't deal with what was going on because they were too afraid to, to talk about it. So they dealt with it in a different manner. Like I grew up with a bunch of alcoholics in my family. Mm. So the way they dealt with their feelings or their mental issues was we're going to get really hammered, maybe do a little, you know, candy and then see what happens at night. You know what I mean? And then I've heard stories my whole life uh, about my uncles fighting all the time in the Bronx to the point where I'll never forget. Uh, I was talking to my girlfriend about this the other day when I realized how tough the world could be. I was in second grade and a mother told her daughter not to hang out with me because I'm going to turn out to be like my uncles. So when I heard that, that switched my whole demeanor and I just became a very, I decided if I'm going to be a black sheep, if I'm not going to be given a chance, I'm going to be the blackest sheep you've ever seen. So I'm going to fight everyone in the school. I'm going to fight everybody everywhere else. You know what I mean? And it was also me dealing with my own mental stuff, even at that young of age. Why don't people like me? Why, you know, being mixed? Why don't the Irish side like me? Why don't the Puerto Rican side like me? All this stuff is going through a kid's brain. Yeah. And then, you know, you hit teenage years and then you're filled with testosterone and you're just angrier then too. So it just, it, it, it's like a snowball effect. You know what I mean? You, you don't talk about it and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger until you explode or you do something to either A, hurt yourself, or B, hurt someone else because you don't know how to deal with it. You know, and I, and I think it's over now. I think it's about time now. Everybody wants to be woke, and it's 2022 and everything. Okay, then let's talk about stuff that's going on with us inside. Then let's not just do the artificial stuff. Let's go deep then. If we're going to be real woke about it, let's get deep then about it. Because everybody, I, someone in the uh, AEW locker room, I'm not going to say who it was, because, you know, it's not my place. They said something to me like, Eddie, I don't feel normal. And I laughed. And I said, what, what does that mean? We make our own normal. Nobody tells me what's normal. No one tells Lars what's normal, or Dennis what's normal, anybody. We make our own normal. Because not everybody has to deal with what we have to deal with. You know, on our own. So that's the thing I stick with. There ain't no such thing as normal, folks. You make your own. That's you know? fair. That's fair. Well, I, I, you know, that's one of the questions I wanted to ask, and I think this is a good segue about it because it sounds like we have a lot of similarities in, in how we dealt with not fitting in or the, the craziness that was going on. I found wrestling, pro wrestling, and it was like an escape. And I was wondering if that's how you found it as well. Was it something that like where you would see on TV and you could kind of escape that reality for a second? Yeah. Was that like a go-to for you? Is that how you... Oh yeah, without without a shadow of a doubt. Um, first wrestling match I ever saw was uh, Hogan and Andre, mm-hmm. WrestleMania three on a on a VHS tape, folks. <laughs> and my mother saw how that kept me quiet because I was a hyper kid. <laughs> you know what I mean? And my poor my poor beautiful Puerto Rican mother must have been like pulling a hair out because all I would do was run around the house like a madman, breaking He Man toys and breaking G.I. Joe toys and then crying about it. But anyway, (laughs) she found that wrestling would calm me down. And I would actually sit down for the whole three hours, four hours. Well, back then, it was like a five-hour pay-per-view where they had like a little intermission in the the middle. But, you know, that's the only thing that kept me quiet. And then as the years gone on, pro wrestling was the only thing that was consistent in my life. Mm. It was always like NWA, WCW was on... Saturdays and Sundays, Superstars and Wrestling Challenge, Saturday and Sunday. Then when Raw hit, there's your Monday night programming. When Nitro came, there's your Monday night. It was always consistent. Even ECW, when Heyman, I guess, decided to pay the MSG uh, offices to show his, you know, ECW tape, ECW will pop up on late Saturday nights. It was the only thing that was consistent in my life. And like you said, it was an escape. Like I was by myself and I was in that world whenever that was on. I was totally into it. Nothing was bothering me. No, whatever ex-girlfriend or this kid said something to me in, in, the, in the park that night in Van Cortland or this kid tried to hit me with a baseball bat a couple months ago. I can't wait to see him. You know, all that was gone 
because I was stuck on the on pro wrestling. All right, I, I'm going to change directions here, and I didn't mean to bring it so deep so early, but I'm glad we 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 talked about this off because it was something that I really want to talk about, but. You're a guy everybody roots for in wrestling. You are every man's man. And when anything good has ever happened, people cheer and, and we root for you. You you make it to AEW. I've seen many interviews where you've talked about how it took weeks after you signed your contract before it hit you that I'm a contracted wrestler. Do you feel like today, right now, during this interview, you've made it in the wrestling industry? No. What does no. What would it take for you to feel that way? When I retire and I reached everything I wanted to reach, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm that kind of animal that won't be satisfied until I'm on my deathbed, you know, because there's always something else to do. Like I finally got the contract and then I said, okay, I want to be the number one guy. That's the first thing that ran through my head. I didn't care where I was on the card. I was like, I'm going to be the number one guy in this company, but I'm going to do it right. I'm not going to cut anyone's legs out. I'm not going to go to, the bosses and shit talk somebody, you know what I mean? And, and stab them in the back. I'm going to do it by going out there and, and producing in the ring. I have a thing that I tell Butcher and Blade all the time. We have to force the hand. So whatever they give us, we do it better than they expect. And then we force them to keep us on or to put us up in higher places on the card. You know what I mean? I, and I tell a lot of young guys that too, force the hand. Because I don't care who they bring in. To AEW. I really don't. It doesn't bother me. It just make okay, outwork me then. Outperform me in that ring. Either outdo me in a promo, which to me, like I've told people before, they're not promos, they're therapy sessions mm. for me when I talk. Outdo me on that, outdo me in the ring. I, if you can do that, then all good for you. I don't think you can, though. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because <laughs> I push myself to that. Because you, it, it, it's a good, healthy competition when you when you just do when you have to do it in the ring and not backstage. Well, you know, I, speaking of your promos, every time that you do get on the mic, I always feel that there's more realness there than with a lot of guys. You know, you can tell when it's coming from a real place, right? You know, you can tell, you know, that's why you believed Ric Flair. That's yeah. why you believed Dusty Rhodes. That's why you believe a lot of these guys, right? And I put you in that category for sure. Thank you. Your character has sort of, you know, evolved over time. Do you feel like, you know, because of that pain, because of those experiences that you've had through your life, does that help you evolve that character by bringing that stuff out? Oh, yeah. Without a shadow of a doubt. You know, every time I go in there to, and I say cut a promo and I'll put up parentheses on it. It's everything. Everything that's bothered me for that week or for that year or for that month or for even years, I'll get it out verbally, but morph it into a pro wrestling uh, kind of thing. You know what I mean? So that people really don't know the full extent of what's going on, but they can feel it. Because it's coming, like you said, it's coming from a real place. It's coming from my gut, what I'm, what I'm talking about. And I just mix it into a pro wrestling type of situation. You know what I mean? And it's healthy for me. It's better than drinking and going out to the bars and trying to swing right away, you know? Well, I wanted to add, add another part to this question because mm -hmm. it can be so real and it could be so powerful. Do you ever worry about like, I'm giving it too much? Do I need to pull back? Or do you just kind of unhinged, just go in there and just deliver? It's just, it's, it's like stream of conscious yeah yeah you nailed it i just go but there are days where uh after the uh showdown i had with punk as i like to say i had to walk away from everybody so i can break out of that mental where i just wanted to kill everybody and you know what i mean and, and everything i said to punk was real and I just had to break out of that because then I would have been miserable the whole day. You know what I mean? Yeah. I would have been sitting, as my father would say, sitting in my own shit and not getting right. out of my own way. So, yeah, there's moments, you know what I mean? And there was a moment with Mox, when me and Mox were yelling at each other in Jacksonville, where we went back and forth and I had to walk away from everybody because I was so in, into it. I, I was right. 17 again. Right. 
after those two uh, showdowns or promos, whatever you want to call it, I was 17 again. And when I was 17, that's basically my character is me at 17. <laughs> when I was at 17, I was just angry. Mm. I hated the world. I wanted to fight everybody. I, in a sick kind of twisted way, I was suicidal in a different way where I didn't want to kill myself, but I wanted someone else to do it. You know what I mean? Like I wanted to push that envelope or for instance, you know, I haven't told a lot of people this, but I remember hanging out. I would see a bunch of guys on the street corner who I didn't know. And I would go one, two, three, four. There's four of them. One of them was going to beat me up. Let me get one of them at least. <laughs> Cause that, that was my mental was forget. I'm not worthy. Let me just fight. Let me go out in the blaze of glory. You know what I mean? All this stuff yeah. you think when you're younger and you could think when you're older too, if you don't break out of it, but that's my mental when I was 17. So that's my mental in the ring. And, and when I'm talking and the therapy, like I tell you, and there's some days, man, it gets real deep where I feel like I'm 17 again. Cause I can feel that homicide says, this is weird. Homicide, my mentor and one of my you know closest friends always tells me how weird it is when I tell them I get this cold feeling in my stomach when the adrenaline starts to go. And that's when I get worried because I remember as a kid, when I would get that cold feeling in my stomach was right before I was about to fight somebody. Or like right before I was gonna smack someone. Like I knew this was gonna happen. I was gonna throw a punch. So there's, there's certain times, like I said, the punk sh showdown and what I did with Mox and even what I did with Chris recently, I had to walk away so I could break out of that 17 year old mental so I can actually be an adult, <laughs> you know what I mean? And hang out with the girlfriend after and the guys, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, here's how different that is because it was one of your promos versus Jericho, and Lars and I, we text back and forth during all the AEW shows because we're like little kids. We love the show, <laughs> and you had said something, and Lars sends me a text that says, that's why I want to be best friends with that guy, and, it, and it's true because you your promos come off very relatable, so when I hear you talk about that… Uh, it, it, it's weird because you're this fan favorite that somehow connects with everybody, but in your mind, it's, it, it, I, I hear you saying it's so much different than how we as the fans interpret it on TV. Yeah, I'm, I'm fighting myself. You know what I mean? When I talk to people and they even tell me, oh, you got your mental health down. Absolutely not. I do not. Every day is a struggle. You know what I mean? Yesterday I had a, a bad couple hours yesterday and I had to work through that. You know what I mean? Everybody still has to work. Uh, that promo, or again, quotations, with Jericho, everything I said on that was true. After the fan fest, after a couple of people came up to me and told me, you know, it was kind of de heavy when they were like, you know, we didn't do, we didn't hurt ourselves because we read your tri tr uh, Players Tribune article. Or we heard what you said on this show or that show. And I'm sitting there like, what? I'm just me. Like, I don't see myself as that. So I just remember not wanting to go, not wanting to wrestle Jericho the next night. I didn't want to do it because I was so nervous that, you know, all these people say that I helped them. And then if I have a shitty match or something, you know what I mean? I got in my own head and it went like down this rabbit hole. And then it was like, yep, I'm not worth it. You know what I mean? Whatever, whatever. But then I got up, you know what I mean? And put my big boy pants on, as they say, you know what I mean? And I said, I got to do it. So that was all true. And I remember after the match with Jericho, I went back to the hotel room before hanging out with everybody. And I just cried because I didn't know what else to do. You know what I mean? I didn't know whether to scream, yell or whatever. I didn't know how to handle that moment. And then I was thinking about the people who said they didn't, you know, hurt themselves because of me. And, you know, I just cried in the room. Once I was done crying, I was like, okay, I'm going out with the guys. You know what I mean? But it gets heavy because I don't see myself as uh, Eddie Kingston, this and that. You know what I mean? I still see myself as that 17 year old kid on the street corner on East 237th Street, just trying to do good. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to be better every day. Do you think it there, you know, is there been points when you've been wrestling in a match where the switch doesn't, or the switch, the fighting switch, the fight or flight switch gets turned on and you've had to sort of pull back and or regroup and take a breath and kind of go, okay, 
this is, I mean, it is a contest. It is physical. I know for me, even wrestling my friends or whatever, something, there's a point that where, you know, it becomes now, you know, even, no. you know, tickle fighting with my girlfriend or whatever. I, then I be, I become competitive yeah. and I have to win. So is, has there been any of those moments for you in the professional wrestling ring? To me, my competition is the locker room. It's not just the guy I'm in the ring with. You know what I mean? Uh, my competition is the whole entire locker room. It's always been like that when I was on the independents or even AEW. You know what I mean? And I try to look at it healthy. Not like everyone's my competition. Or it's me against everyone and my back's against the wall. Not that. It's competition of I want to steal the show. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to, no one's going to do that but me and my opponent. Even if my opponent doesn't want to steal the show, I will drag you. <laughs> I will forcefully drag you so we can steal this show. Especially pay-per-view matches. That's where, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm trying to steal the show every time I'm out there, but especially pay-per-views, I'm trying to get everybody talking about whatever I did in my match. And that's where the competition comes in. And that switch stays on, man. The only mm. time that switch goes off is when I go outside and I see my man Ortiz and we relax. You know what I mean? Because he's the, one of the rare people that can calm me down. Outside my girls, my homie uh, Monkey Ortiz, you know? Him and Mox. Out of all people, Mox calms me down. <laughs> the weird dynamic. Lars, I, I got to ask kind of you, and then it's an Eddie K Kingston question, of course, but listen to him talk. Doesn't he sound like he has the mentality of a deathmatch wrestler? And, and I guess my question to you, Eddie, is you for me, listening to you talk, you if, if I didn't know you, I'd go, this is a guy that gets hit with light tubes all the time just to feel. Uh, well, he, he has. I <laughs> have. I have. Yeah, I grew up in that generation that okay. where – if we wanted to make, especially my time, if you wanted to make a little extra money or actually good money, you had to do death matches. Sure. Even though by the time you got your stitches, if you had to get stitches or by the time you got cleaned up or whatever, you didn't really have that much at the end of the day. You sure. know what I mean? But that's how it was back then because there was only a lot of companies at that time were just trying to be the new ECW. Right. Or they were trying to be more violent than ECW instead of trying to pave their own way like Ring of Honor did later when I broke in. And then you kind of had to be the deathmatch guy if you wanted to get respect and more money. And then I think sorry. guys like, oh, I'm sorry, just real quick. Guys like Homicide, Low Key, Punk, AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, Amazing Red. I know I'm missing a lot of names. So if they hear it and I don't mention their name, I apologize. But a lot of those indie guys who could work without doing death matches actually made that a cool hip thing to do finally. You know what I mean? But then I look at some of the death match guys and they're some of the smartest, sweetest people in the world that you get in there with them. So I've I've learned a lot about because I was not a death match guy growing up as a fan. And I guess my follow-up question would be, how hard was it for you to either break out of the mold or not get typecast? Because in wrestling, we love to put people in groups. You're a deathmatch guy. You're a high flyer. You're a luchador. Was it hard for you to break out of that as a deathmatch guy? Uh, not really, because I, I worked everywhere on the independents. I was at uh, IWA Mid-South, which is a hardcore mm -hmm. company, but they had wrestling there. So I would do both. Hardcore and wrestle. CZW, same thing, hardcore mm -hmm. and wrestling. And I would do both. Then I was trained at Chikara where it was just straight lucha, straight wrestling. So I had that. And then other places would just book me just to wrestle. So I had both, of, you know, I was able to wrestle other places. And then when the bigger independent companies that also did hardcore wrestling and wrestling, they were like, you know what, Eddie, we like you wrestling, go to just wrestle. So I broke out of that on my own, luckily. Because there was a stretch for like two months where I was cutting my forehead almost every weekend just to, you know what I mean, bleed. It was getting a little, a little rough. Well, do you find, do you, I mean, because that your generation, along with Moxley and these guys who are now like, and I mean, I feel like you're a face of the AEW company. And I feel after that match with Jericho, that solidified you 
because with the work you did with punk, I was like, why isn't this thing fucking going for another year? Like I feel, yeah. because I mean, it, you could feel it. And it was, it, you, you guys were, it was like this, you know? There was a lot and, of things said, there was a lot of things said between me and him that we did not get to say to each other. And as long as we known each other, you know what I mean? Right. And it was either because I just didn't want to say it to him because I didn't want to deal with him or he just didn't want to deal with me. You know what I mean? But when we got the chance to, we let it all out and people enjoyed it. What else can I say? You know well, I mean? no, I mean, I, as a fan, I loved it, you know, because I saw that you guys were raising each other and that's yeah. what you want to see, mm -hmm. right? As a fan. Now, whatever personal stuff is going on behind the scenes, I don't want to know about it because I love each of you, right? I, yeah, and the fans don't need to know. A lot of times people forget that. They don't need to know that. They just need to feel it. Well, that's what I'm saying. There was a feeling there that I felt like it could have gone for a while. It could have been a whole program. And I think that's how good you are. Thank and you. it's also a testament to punk as well. But Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're talking about you here. But it's like, I can see you going against literally anybody and making it work. And I'm wondering, is that, do you feel like you've learned that because of all that independent wrestling? Do you, because I mean, independent wrestling is different. It's not TV where there's times, you know, you yeah. get your marks, things like that. But because there's a flow of independent wrestling and AEW has a flow like an indie show, mm. it's obviously the production's a little bit more. But do you feel like you've learned that because of your time on the indies? Oh, without a doubt, I learned so much on the independence because, like you said, you got to get the people to care right away, especially on the indie show. Right. Because a lot of the times they don't even know who you are when you first start out. So you've got to get them to care about you because if the fans care about you, then the promoter will have you back. Then you'll be able to make more money. Then you go from this one place to this other place so that because of the, because of the word of mouth you got from place A. You know what I mean? So, for instance... If I debut in Chicago for an independent company, I got to kill it there because I just got there. I got to kill it. I got to get the people emotionally invested. I got the people to care about me so that this promoter will now bring me back next month and the month after that and the month after that. Then my name gets a little bit of buzz. And then maybe I go to Ohio and work with somebody in Ohio and then do the whole cycle again because you have to get the people to care about you, especially if they don't see you on TV every week. They don't care. So you have to get them to care about you. And then definitely learn that from the independence. And I carried that with me to AEW. So I want people to care. Because in my, everyone has their own outlook on, on professional wrestling. My outlook, and I, you know, I'm a little hard headed. So I believe this is right. And no one can tell me any different. But <laughs> um, as I get older, I, I soften up. But we're in the emotion business. That's it. We're not in the professional wrestling business. We're not in the sports entertainment business. We're in the emotion business. Just like any other part of entertainment, people have to be emotionally invested in the company or the character or the person or whatever. They have to be emotionally invested. If not, they don't care if you live or die. Right. They don't care if you win or lose or if you beat up someone or you get beat up. You have to get the people to care about you. And I believe the best way to do it is just be honest. Be honest with who you are and, and, and what you're trying to do. You know what I mean? Don't go, what would my character do in this situation? <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want a character. What would you do? You know, I mean? When they ask me, Eddie, what would you do in this situation? Nine out of ten times, it's, oh, I'll try to gouge his eye or bite him or something or fight him. You know what I mean? But again, it's, the reason why that works for me because that's what I would really do. Right. And that's why I think a lot of young guys, I tell them, what would you really do? And a lot of times they look at me with blank stares on their face and I go, oh man, it's going to be a little <laughs> rough one on you kids. <laughs> so you know what I mean? All right. I'm, I'm going to ask a dumb fanboy question because- no, Nothing's dumb. I never, I, I hate it when people say that <laughs> fanboys are marks. I'll tell you why. I'm probably the biggest mark in pro wrestling because I decided to do this for a living. I decided <laughs> to beat up my body for a living. Right. Instead of just being a fan and sitting in the audience, I decided, you know what? I'm, I'm a mark and I love this so much that I'm going to put myself in there. So let's just get rid of that word. I hate that word now. 
I'm with you. I've, rant, <laughs> I've ranted on that being called a mark because in no other pro industry do you see the athletes just trash the fans when the fans <laughs> are trying to give them money all the time. So that's, yeah. but now that you're, you, you, you're kind of like us, we're all fans. Do you yeah. still get excited when you meet new guys? Like, Oh my God, I watched you on TV or are you cool as a cat in Kingston? I know. Oh I, no, not in the beginning. Not in the beginning. No. Now I am. I talk to Arn Anderson all the time. <sighs> but in the beginning, it was, "Hey, how you doing, Mister Anderson? How's everything, sir?" You know what I mean? Because it's it's the fucking enforcer. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. and same thing with Tully. Same thing with a lot of people in that locker room. Like I talk to Jim Ross about Mid South Wrestling all the time. He has to be so sick of talking to me <laughs> about it. You know what I mean? He has to be. And you know what? Not going to lie, I don't care. Keep talking about it. I'm, I'm being selfish, you know? But uh, all those guys, man, because I want to learn from them. You know what I mean? It's not even just being a fan of this. I want to learn. I want to know what they think in their heads, what they would do in this situation. Or what made money for them back in the day. Can I update it now? You know? Like I told a lot of people, everyone knows I love uh, the old Japan 90s, especially the four pillars, uh, Tawe, Masawa, Kawada, and Kobashi, all I want in my life is for Kawada to be an asshole to me, and I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. See, so that, that's the fanboy part of me. Right. You know what I mean? Then I'll ask him, hey, what did Giant Baba teach you? You know what I mean? Right, right, I want, right. Yeah, I definitely do in the beginning would fanboy out for the guys, but then I would go, okay, now they know who I am. Let me start asking questions. Let me start picking their brain, because honestly, I believe you have to be if you think you know everything about said business, then you're an idiot. Then you're a fool. Because I'll never forget Jerry Lynn telling me about 2012. He goes, Eddie, I don't know anything. I learn something new all the time. And Jerry Lynn's a man that's been in every major company in the world and is respected. So to me, if that man says he doesn't know anything and learns every day something new, I have no right to ever say I know anything. So it's always about learning. So, yeah, I love that. Like I said, I love the guys that we have in AEW. You know what I mean? The older veteran guys. I love it because I'll talk to them all day to the point where I get in trouble because either we have to cut a promo or do a segment and I'm talking to them, telling them the production, yeah, I'll be there in a minute. Well, you know, one of the things that I, I've noticed about your career, and I, it, it's, it's not that you win all that much. You know what I mean? And especially in your in your big matches. But I mean, it's a yeah. testament to who you are though, as a wrestler though, that you don't have to win. You're like a, you know, it's like Roddy Piper or something like, you know, or a Ric <laughs> Flair, you know, he won, he won 14 times, you know, that's all we know about. I mean, they're all world championships. But my point is, it's like, does, does that, is there, is there anybody that you've been in the ring with where you feel like there's still a little bit of unfinished business? Like, like I could, I wish I had another run with this guy or yeah. fuck. I don't ever want to fucking get in the ring again with this guy. I mean, I'm not looking for the dirt, but just, <laughs> more, but more or less like, you know, it, maybe there was something that was cut off too soon. Maybe you yeah. felt that way. There's, there's a couple people like, you know, I wish, I know I say I don't want him at AEW, but Claudio Casignoli, I would love him to be in AEW so I can just smack the shit out of him. Cause we have a lot of unfinished, <laughs> business uh like you said you don't want to know the backstage stuff that's fine but there's some serious stuff between us and uh i would love to end it and to see if he does the right thing at AEW. but again not my show so i don't you know i don't book it uh definitely him punk definitely you know at least they're in AEW, so i may have another chance at that because like you said there's a lot of there's a lot more history there to to explore with me and punk um let me see who else. Uh, also, anybody. I'll get with anybody in the ring. I don't really care. You know what I mean? Like, you're not. The way I look at it is, you're not going to pull out a gun. You're not going to pull out a knife. I'm fine. I'll be okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? I've had things broken before. They broken bones heal. I'll be all right. Mm. But uh, so definitely, without a shadow of a doubt, Claudio is number one, and and Punk's definitely number two. But Claudio for sure, because I just I want to kind of end whatever we the beef we've had so right fair enough it 
it seems like a lot of times you have this boyish excitement when you come to the ring. You can tell that you love what you do. <laughs> yeah. And and like once again, this is a conversation Lars has had. You come down and sometimes you you want to look mean, but you can see it in your eyes that like you're like, I'm living my dream. Is, yeah. is, is that facial expression something that you try to have to either hide or overcome as you come to the ring? Or are you okay with saying, you know what? I'm the luckiest I'm, guy in the world. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty much okay because when when the music hits, Eddie Kingston's alive. That's it. The other, the you know, whatever I'll say, Eddie Moore is dead. Right. That person does not exist anymore. It's only Eddie Kingston. So whatever you see with my face coming to the ring, if you see me pissed off, then I'm pissed off. If you see me, like you said, with the little twinkle in my eye, then I have that. There's no hiding. You know, I mean? I'm like my mother. She can't hide anything either. People know right on her face if she's mad or happy or sad. It's the same thing with me. You know what I mean? And there's nothing fake about it because Eddie Kingston's taken over at that point. Eddie Kingston's alive and well until we go through that curtain backstage. And that may even take a couple more minutes there. Like I told you, I, I may need to walk away, go outside and breathe the fresh air or something. You know what I mean? To, to get out of Eddie Kingston mode. But yeah. There's nothing fake about it. What you see is what you get at that point. You know, <clears throat> I want to go a little bit into the mental health stuff because yeah. I, I've been sober ne nearly 29 years. And I know that oh, once, awesome. I, thank you, once I kind of got a replacement for that, which I had to find, right? I could kind of, you know, life started to kind of expand for me, right? And a lot of people relate to you because you're pretty vocal, as we've been talking about about your personal problems and how you're feeling inside. So when you're watching others go through these things and people that are close to you, and sometimes you hear about it, sometimes you don't hear about it. What's the, do you ever approach them and let them know that maybe, hey, it's getting out of hand? Or are you that friend? Or are you the one that's kind of like, wait till they come to you? Yeah, I wait. I wait till they come to me because uh, before I decided, and to me, it took the pandemic for me to go, okay, enough. Time to get better. You know what I mean? And it, when the pandemic hit, it was funny. For some people, it hurt them, you know, and God bless those people. But for me, being able to be alone by myself in my own mind and then deciding no more. I'm not going to be this person anymore. I'm not going to be this angry, lunatic person that shoots himself in the foot anytime he gets close to reaching a goal. Right. You know what I mean? And there's some days where I still think I don't deserve this, but I fight through that. And I work through it. But the reason why I bring that up is because nobody can come up to me and tell me, hey, man, what you're doing is wrong or whatever. Because I didn't want to hear that. You know what I mean? I needed to reach a certain point. Some say rock bottom. Others say different things. I needed to hit a certain point where I had to make the decision for myself that I wanted to change. So with my you know, very small group of friends I have, very small because... I just don't trust a lot of people, but I have a very small group of friends. And when they feel like calling me, they all know they can. And they know I'm not going to be the one to go up to them and go, hey, man, you know, I'm going to wait. Because when, they when they're ready to open up, you know what I do? I pick up the phone. I put it on speaker. I go, go ahead. And they're like, what do you mean? Just go. Just talk. Go ahead. I'm not going to answer anything. Go. Because they don't want to hear it. Your advice, I just want to get it out. Let them get it out first. And then if you have advice, give it to them. You know, and I, and I believe a very little thing for mental health is just let people talk. Not everybody wants to be fixed right now or ready yeah. fixed. Because there's no such thing as being fixed, folks. Like I tell all my friends when they come to me with their deal, I tell them every day I'm working. My final form is me in that casket. So every day I'm changing. Every day I'm getting better. You know what I mean? So that's why I tell them. I said, just call me. R rant. Go ahead. I don't have to agree with what you're saying. All I have to do is listen. And I think a lot of people need that. Just someone to listen. You've mentioned your mom a few times in this interview. Oh, I'm a mama's boy to the court, to the death. I don't care what <laughs> anyone says. My mother has defended me in front of cops when everyone in the neighborhood knew I was guilty of whatever I did that night. <laughs> But my mother stood there and said, not my son. And then when the cops <laughs> left, she said, come here and beat the piss out of me. <laughs> I still remember 
I did some bad things. I had a couple of dollars on me from other people that wasn't, it wasn't my money. And she decided to beat me up over it. And then she took the money mm. and said, you like to be a tough guy? Well, I just took your money. And she walked away. And I said, okay. That's the Puerto Rican Bronx woman in her. That's, that's the madness in her. You know what I mean? As my father stood there like this, giving a little <laughs> golf clap. Well, yeah, I'm a mama's boy to the death. Well, have, have she ever really had a chance to see you wrestle on the big stage yet? What, what kind of moments do you guys share? Do you talk to her before you go out? Because we talk about this a lot with a few other wrestlers about their, the <clears throat> dynamic of their parents getting into the industry and then going from the middle, the bottom, to the, to the finally to the tippy top. And now that you're at the tippy top, what what's what does your mother or vice she give you and you know does she, she like the wrestling same thing what she tells me she first off she asks me if i took my zoloft she asks me <laughs> that every morning because she knows how i get so i go yeah ma we're good well have fun <laughs> ignore everybody hang out with who you like that's her that's her advice every day i get that especially when she knows i'm on the road she goes ignore everybody only hang out with the people you like and remember you're living your dream job, but it's still a job. And then that's it. That's what she'll say to me. Uh, she got to see me wrestle in New York in Arthur Ashe. So that was special. Her and my dad got to see that. And I just remember grabbing the microphone going, Ma, where are you, Ma? Looking around. Being a typical New Yorker, Ma, where are yeah. you? And all this stuff. And seeing my dad and my mom, you know, they were happy, man. And it's so good to see them happy and smiling because I just sit here and tell you, I did this all by myself. And this was my journey. They were there with me the whole time, my parents. You know what I mean? When I would get fired from one job and I'd be like, I'm not working, I'm gonna go only to wrestling. They were like, all right, but they were still there to help me. They may not have agreed on it, you know what I mean? But they would still be behind me going, no, if this is what you wanna do, go ahead and do it. My father, of course, would be like, just go down to the union hall, please. Like he would always, <laughs> he would always add that in there. You know what I mean? But he was right, because I would go I would go to the union hall, get like a truck or something, unload the truck, get a couple extra dollars, and that would support my wrestling habit, even though he didn't want that, but you know what I mean? Right. But they were always supportive because my dad grew up with a, my grandfather was a very hard man, uh, second generation Irish in New York. And he was a very hard man who did not say he loved his kids at all until the day he died. You know, and my father didn't want to be that person. Trust me, it's hard for my dad sometimes to open up. But when he does, oh my God, it's the floodgates. But anyway, my father's an extremist. He either doesn't say nothing or he says everything. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, he's all, so because of his situation with his dad, he always had my back. Even though I could see him through his teeth, he wants to yell and scream and be like, this is dumb. Go and do regular work. You know what I mean? But he was, he stood by me because of his experience. And I can't never forget that when my dad, like, even my dad tells me that he goes, when you have a kid, remember what you put me through and you better support them. Cause I supported you, you little fuck. I go, all right. Dad. <laughs> he calls me little fucking boy a lot. <laughs> so yeah, no, the, well, my parents were always there. They were always there, even though sometimes they didn't want to be, you know what I mean? Especially when, like I tell people I shot myself in the foot a lot and perfect example, I was on a roll. I was at Ring of Honor. I was at PWG, Mid-South, Combat Zone Wrestling, like all these supposed big indies. And one day I got in my head saying, I don't deserve this. And I let the demons eat at me and I started drinking. And I missed like three or four flights on shows and just didn't go. You know what I mean? And my father was still there. And my mother was still there helping me. Tell me, what are you doing? Get yourself better. You know what I mean? And it was a vicious cycle where I would mess up, do good, then mess up again because I would get in my own head. You know what I mean? And, and feel, like, feel like I didn't deserve whatever I was getting. Because I had to find love for myself, which, trust me, there's some days where I love myself and there's other days, especially when I eat too much ice cream and I go, you fat fuck. You know what I mean? So <laughs> there's days. You, just, you know what? You sound, you sound very Irish Catholic to me. Yes. I tell everyone I'm a, I tell everyone, I got this from my uncles, actually. My uncle Kevin, rest in peace. I'm an Irish Puerto Rican Catholic from the Bronx. I have a lot of guilt. <laughs> That's what I tell them. I got a lot of guilt. It wasn't my fault, but original sin. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, um, 
I want to kind of shift gears here and get it back into the wrestling thing. Uh, mm -hmm. As far as like the creative freedom that I see that a lot of these guys have now, um, when you, and I ask this to, to most of the wrestlers, cause it's, it's, it's actually, I feel like a, a, a very much get to know you question. At the end of the day, do you think the creative freedom is the most important thing to express yourself? Or do you think it's about the, the money? Because I know, you no, know- No, it's never the, about the money. Okay. I can cut because, you off right there, never about that. Right. Because I, but it seems like the, the priorities have switched over the last maybe 10, 15 years on mm -hmm. this. It's like more of an artistic approach as yeah. opposed to a financial approach. Would you say that that's a fair assessment? Oh yeah, without a shadow of a doubt, because now people are using that word art now and throwing it around, you know what I mean? <laughs> Where when it comes to pro wrestling, but yeah, it's definitely switched. To me, it's never been about money. I just never wanted to do anything else in my life. Right. I wanted to do this since I was nine years old. You know what I mean? And if I was doing this for money, I would have quit maybe my first year in after not getting paid for a whole year and traveling to state, to state, to state to maybe get 20 bucks, maybe. And that 20 bucks went to gas. You know what I mean? And maybe I would get, you know, a beef jerky or something on the way home. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was never about money, but it's definitely now the creative freedom, especially at AEW is really, I've never seen it that free. You know, and I'm also just a regular worker. I, whatever my boss tells me to do, I always ask him, can I say it in my own words? And he goes, yep. I go, okay, cool, thanks. That's all I need. I know where we're going. I know where you want it to go. I'll get there. Just let me do it my way. So it, so it sounds like it's coming from me, not from a writer or right. not from my boss. You know what I mean? I have to believe it and I have to feel it. Right. And then I can do it my way. But well, yeah, that's think, the way you sell it, right? I mean, yeah. that's the way, if it's got to be there. Yeah, yeah if, I, if I'm not feeling it, I'll tell whoever I'm with or whoever gave the idea. If I'm not feeling it, I'll tell them, look, I'm not feeling it. Give me something. Give me something I can sink my teeth into so I can actually feel it and bring myself into it. Because if I can't throw myself into something, then what's the point of doing it? Then I'm just half-assing it. And then the people will know. And once the people see me half-ass it, it's almost like the people seeing junkyard dog do some dirty stuff in Louisiana. They stop believing in them. Mm. So if now they see me just going through the motions, they're going to stop believing in me. And I don't want that because I don't want to stop believing in myself. I don't want to lie to anybody. You know what I mean? I don't want to get into an angle or, or, or cut a promo that I have no feeling for because then people will be like, what is this? And then that's when they get turned on you. We got one more question a piece before we play the hottest game in all of the wrestling <laughs> podcast industry with Eddie Kingston. And in talking about this, you look at all the different companies, wrestling companies around. AEW is the only one for me that I and I'm projecting that feels like the wrestlers take pride in the company. It's not that they show up, they get a check, they read their script, they go home. But you, you see the wrestlers inside and out of the ring. They represent AEW as not only workers, but fans of their own product. And how does, in, in today's climate with wrestlers, where it's politicking and you know buying the fastest cars, how does an atmosphere like that get built in a company like that? And you're a guy that's been all around many different companies. You're probably the best suited to answer that question. Hmm. Well... There's a lot of us in AEW who have either A, never went to the big time or have gone to the big time and didn't like it. Right. And now we're part of this company where, yeah, we have freedom, but we're also appreciated in, in a different way. You know what I mean? And we just appreciate what we have. For instance, me, after 20 years on the independence grinding, being able to go to a TV show is something that's gr just great to me. Whether I'm on or not, just the fact that I'm going to possibility of being on TV, I'm happy with and I'm grateful for. So that's why people, you know, when I cut my promos and I say AEW, this and that, yeah, I ride with AEW because they rode with me. You know what I mean? And then you look at the people 
who left WWE who are now with AEW. Either they weren't happy at WWE or their contracts expired, whatever the case. Now they go to AEW and they're like, oh, wow, this is different. I feel appreciated here or I feel whatever they want to say or they have more freedom there. You know what I mean? That's on the person. But that's why people ride with AEW when they get there because it's a different environment. Now for the young ones in the locker room, you know, they're going to learn. You know what I mean? That not everywhere is like this. That's why I think guys like myself 20 years in and other guys who've had X amount of years in who've grinded or been at WWE and now here see it for what it is and are appreciative of it. That they know that it's not always like this in wrestling companies. That there's not that much freedom. And there's not a boss that's going to talk to you about an angle instead of telling you, no, you're doing this and that's it. You know what I mean? We have open discussions. So that's why I think so many people represent AEW that are there and ride with it so hard. It's because it's different. Well, it is different. I mean, I've been in the back and in the culture of your company, AEW, WWE, yeah. uh, Impact Wrestling. You got uh, AEW and Impact, I'd see it would say that is the most similar because it's like it, everybody's very nice. I mean, not saying that the WWE, they weren't nice, but there was, there's not that tension. Yeah, that's what everyone tells me. I've never been to WWE, but every person I've ever met that's gone there has told me about that tension. And that got to be a rough way to live, man. And if I'm not even a fucking wrestler or a worker and I walk in and I can feel, I mean, I am a performer and I do my yeah. thing and I've been in enough environments to know, but, uh, in, you know, when you're in a band for 30 years, you know what tension is. But yeah. <laughs> But my point is, it's like being at AEW up in Chicago when I came there and how welcoming and how everybody is is very nice. And, and just you could feel the atmosphere. There's no there's no bullshit. If there is, it feels like it gets quashed or squashed pretty, 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 uh, pretty quick. Yeah, you know, things that, are said. Things are said that, that no one backstage holds their tongue. Well, I don't. But yeah, I know a lot don't either. If we see something that's detrimental to the company, somebody will speak up. Doesn't always have to be me. There's always, there's other people there. Some people will pull people to the side and let them know, hey man, that's not it. You know what I mean? Well, they won't do what I usually do, which is, hey, in the middle of everyone, hey, you mother whatever, you know what I mean? Right, right. And then, well, and, I mean, you know. Well, the one thing that I fucking didn't do, I, it's like Moxley was there. I have his fucking book. I've been reading his book. The few times I wanted to come and go up to him and ask him to autograph my book, he was in the middle of something. And then, then he fucking disappeared. And oh, that's like, what he always does. Yeah. yeah. He always disappears enough. on me. And then next thing you know, I get a text. Where are you? <laughs> I write back to him all the time. I was right next to you. Why'd you leave? <laughs> or I'll text him and go, you're not, Batman's not real. You're not Batman. Stop. <laughs> well, he disappeared. I never got a chance to introduce myself or anything like that. But okay. So my last question before we get into our awesome game, which is, you know, <laughs> uh, I know I'm going to win this one too. But so do you, cause you're not a, you're not a baby face. You're not a heel. You're like, you're, you're just, everybody loves you. Right. So, but they'll, they'll get behind. If you play a bad guy, everybody's like, well, he's just a bad guy. We're still going to love him, but we're going to get back behind this bad guy. Or if you're a good guy in this scenario, then you're the guy that everybody's going to, you know, you, you're, you're in a very unique place that only a few wrestlers have actually been able to achieve right mm -hmm. stone cold steve austin is the first one that would come to mind an anti-hero let's just say for a lack of a better term do you realize that, that about yourself or do you kind of go into your head and say well if i'm playing the fucking heel then i'm going to be the heel no matter what the crowd is doing or whatever yeah. it is or vice versa do you ever like go well fuck i'm just an anti-hero they're going to love whatever anything i fucking do no, I never, I never do that because I always think in my head, believe it or not, I, I have this thing in my head every time I go out that there's, there's going to be crickets. Because I was taught, I was taught years ago, every city you go to, every state you go to, don't ever think you're over. Mm. Don't ever think you're bigger than the crowd because that, at any point in time, that crowd can just shut up when you walk out and then you're done for. Yeah. So I go out there like they're not going to know who I am. So it's like I'm reintroducing myself every time I step out of that curtain. When it comes to babyface or heel, 
I just act like I would act out in the street. Like I told you, it's just, Eddie Kingston's me at 17 just turned up a thousand notches. Right. And I just act the way people go, Eddie, they ask me, they'll tell me an angle and I go, okay. And they're like, is that how you would really act? And I go, well, you want to know the truth? I would actually pick up this or do this or do that. And then we mesh it in because I had, like I tell you, it has to be authentic. So whatever you see me do, whether some people say it's me being a bad guy or me being a good guy, no, it's just me being me. And you, mm. and I've told Tony this, I said, I don't care if the people cheer or boo, as long as they're doing something, as long as I emotionally have them, I'm fine with whatever way we go. I said, put me in a situation I told them and I will act the way I would act in real life. And that's it. Well, it's time for the hottest game in all okay. of wrestling podcasts. <laughs> it's the, ho- I, the, the hottest. I, 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 I like the way you said it. It's so yeah, sultry. I know. I know. <laughs> hey, guys, it's time for... Yeah. You can see my <laughs> face like I ate a bat, like yeah. a Sour Patch Kid or something. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the face everybody gets when we play this game. When so. you do this? Congratulations. Okay. Did you it's guys uh, interview Ruby? Yes. Soho? Yeah. I gotta ask if she made that face too. I gotta ask no, well, her we that later. We, well, see, not only did we, did, she got her name obviously from of course on, on this show, um, but we didn't we didn't have the game established. You're, I think you're uh, number, okay. Th- this is w- number four. Number four. So, but just for for not that I'm counting, but what's the score? Uh, you're winning two to one. Okay. Not that I'm counting. <laughs> you like that? That's and then that's, he says the number. That, that's that's very passive aggressive of him. He's oh, like, no, oh, wow, no. no. passive aggressive, guys. Get guys, Dennis, what's what number is it? Two? How many okay, just I make it. how many? Yeah, how many fingers am I holding up, Dennis? <laughs> yeah, next week he's going to introduce me as the loser. So, you know. oh, I can't. No. Yeah, no, I've been win one. What's going on? <laughs> well, Eddie, that's there you go. Best if you would read your DM, had. I would have tried. So thanks, bud. So, <laughs> I was trying to slide in and we're like, Eddie, what do you watch on TV this yeah, week? Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't yeah. answer none of my DMs because like I told you, I don't even want to look at them. Yeah. I have a beautiful, <laughs> I have a beautiful girlfriend who's a black belt in jujitsu, and I do not feel like her beating me up constantly. I'm not trying so, to you know slide what? in for I don't that even reason, look at my DMs because I don't care. Yeah, I'm right. not trying to slide in for that reason. You're, you're I just, right. I'm just letting you know I don't look at all. So anybody can slide in and be like, hello. And they'd be like, Eddie, I hit you up on a DM. I'd be like, I will never see it. Well, I will never learn. I That's didn't really enough. try to cheat, but we are going to play a game called Guess What Eddie is Watching on TV. So please tell me you watch TV. Yeah. I watch right. YouTube a lot. Okay. Well, well, oh, 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 he watches YouTube. Oh, okay. Boy. So hold on a second. Hold on a second. So are, is it like, are you a cable guy or are you like a streaming guy? Uh, streaming more okay, than cable. Okay. The only reason okay. why I have cable for like NFL and live sports. That's got it. it, got it. All okay. right, so okay. we're going to be all right. We can play the game with Eddie then. Yes, uh, we can. Basically, there's three rounds. Lars and I try to guess what you're watching on TV. If you've seen it and you kind of watch it, it's kind of a half point. If you're you're binging and you're watching the series actively and you like it, it's a whole point. That's simple as that. You dole out the points. So the the biggest heartthrob on TV. By oh, the way, you're looking good. really good lately. You so. know, Mox is going to hate that, by the way. Mox is really going to hate that you're calling me that because he thinks he's the heartthrob of the team, and I'm just like, absolutely not. Well, not anymore. Well, you know, hey, listen, I wouldn't kick out Mox of my bed for eating crackers, but he hasn't been on this fucking show yet. There so you go. When, there he you wants go. To, when he wants to step up and come and be a heartthrob on here, we can That's have right. a chat. Hey, yeah. someone clickbait that shit and post it all over the internet then. <laughs> I'm shocked he's Put not up. watching Moxley right now. Moxley's not a heartthrob or something on the clickbait yeah. thing. Hashtag Moxley's not a heartthrob and yeah. does the wrestling perspective pod. <laughs> just, just so and you know. signs my fucking book and doesn't leave early. Just so you know. You know hey, that's going to be rough because my man disappears. I'd be like, where are you? He'd be like, I'm home. I'd be like, how'd you get home? That's a six hour flight. How'd you get home? <laughs> the show's still going. How are you home? <laughs> Don't ask me how he does it. He just does. I'm home with the baby. What do you mean? I saw you two hours ago. <laughs> That's, All right. That's him, though. He's, he yeah. thinks he's Batman. Well, Fair enough. Lars, you started off. I went last game. Oh, did you? Okay. I think. Not that I keep your count. All right. So 
See, Eddie reminds me, he's like a current guy, but old guy, I'm going to say Eddie binges The Simpsons. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a full point, yeah. I love The Simpsons. What can I say? I grew up in that era when we weren't allowed to watch it when we were kids. It was like on at 9.30 at night on Fox or something. Oh, all right. Go ahead, Dennis. Go ahead. I'm going to take a shot in the dark here and say Walking Dead. No. I fell off that, I think, after... What was the season where Tegan came on? I couldn't tell you. Yeah, there you go. I don't watch. Four, three uh, or four. Three or four. Yeah, after, after that season, I was like, ah, I'm not into it no more. All right, so I'm going to go more current. And I know you like sports. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into the Netflix path because I think he likes his Netflix. And I'm going to probably say, because of his personality, I'm going to go Ozark. No, never seen it. Thank okay, God. okay, okay, okay. Thank God. Here's your chance, Dennis. <laughs> Thank God. I've never heard anyone have that reaction to me not watching the show. <laughs> I mean, that's cool. Yeah, what, what yeah there you go. I've heard that before, but yeah. Thank God. Well... <laughs> You're a badass. So I guess you watch badass stuff. Peaky Blinders. No, never seen it. Ah, all right. Bad. So I kind of win, right? Or do you no, got one, no, more one more round? Oh, oh one, one more, more round. round. Oh, okay. okay. That, that was round number three. two. All right. So if he's watching YouTube. Hmm. Cat videos? No. Ah. No, cat videos. Uh, we're talking about shows here, Dennis. Shows. We can't. It's it's not it's not like Sports Center. That's not a thing. Right. No, no, right? no. Sports no, Center is no. on YouTube TV. Not that. No. Right. Right. No okay. You can't go there. Uh, I'm gonna say. Hmm, I'm gonna say. Uh, fuck. I mean, now I'm stumped. You're gonna have to edit this out. I'm trying to think of the <laughs> name of the name of the show. And Do you want I me to go again uh, while you think? Well, if you take my guess, I'm gonna fucking be I'm gonna have heat. So <laughs> hey babe, what's that show when I when I when I when we got the candles and then I I, I do the shades? What are we what's Play, the name of that Playboy show? Playboy after dark. What's that? We're what's not the name of the show. Well, I forget. Uh, no, we gotta leave this in. What's the name <laughs> yeah, of the show? I'm now. So okay, we have the the candle. She lights the candle. She sets a, she sets a nice little atmosphere in the bedroom. She's a very beautiful, very calm. And then I, and but I we have these electronic shades. So what I do is I hit the shades and make her blow out the candles and move them before the shades come. What's the name of the show? Squid Game. No, but I want to see it. But no. Ah, fuck. Okay. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb. Hell Mary. You're an old school guy. You like cartoons. I've got that from the Simpsons guests. F is for family. Yep. Yes. Whoa. Yes. Okay. Okay. I okay. Okay. Up. All right. All right. All right. Well, then I got to, but then I have a guest because I know he's got to fucking watch this show. If you're going to say F is for family, we got the Simpsons, then this is the tiebreaker, right? Right. This I'm gonna is the say tiebreaker. Fa family guy. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt, family guy. I am. Match me, bitch. Match me. Big mouth. No. Oh, we got a winner. Got no, a winner. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Big mouth was not my thing. <sighs> That's three. That's three for an <laughs> Very sassy with the drink of the water. Very sassy. Oh, we'll just watch the pinky, though. I know <laughs> <laughs> that that pinky means victory. That's, That's what that right. means. That's right. That's right. Not just in the bedroom either. Ooh. But anyway. <laughs> but Eddie Kingston, dude, listen, man. I, it's been such an amazing pleasure to have you on. No, nah, thank so, you guys. Stop. I wish Get you, out of here. Thank you guys. Wait, wait. Uh, I wish, Lars, go this, ahead. Yes. This is how we ended. I'm sorry. I'm. I, I, oh, uh, does the victor end it or? Does <laughs> <laughs> you gotta give it up, folks. <laughs> folks, you gotta give it up. He, when he wins, he wins. I'm. I'm uh, that's way. right. That's right. You gotta I am not a good winner. <laughs>
He's television's heartthrob, Eddie Kingston. <laughs> oh, you geez. can catch him on AEW Dynamite. And everyone uh, tweet at Mox and tell him he's not the heartthrob of the team. That's right. No. That's <laughs> right. You tell him. You tell Until him he gets fucking, on the show on and the signs show. the book. That's right. Sign the book. Come on the show. You could be the heartthrob. Heartthrob. The next heartthrob there, Mox. The next, the next heartthrob. <laughs> the next one. The next one. Well, the guy to the left of me is Lars. If you look below him are his tour dates. Make sure you go see him. You I can't see it now, but they'll be there. Uh, <laughs> make sure you see him when you're in town and you tell him that he's not the heartthrob of this podcast. I am. Because, yeah. I, come on. You got to give me something, guys. Well, I just lost. I'm, well, you know what? Here's the thing. Put a sock in it. Eddie Kingston, where can we find you on social media? What are your your? Oh, this is our, here comes the rough part. You ready? Okay. I gotta really okay. think about this because I forget. I think it's Mad <laughs> Kingston eighty one on Twitter, right? I don't know. It's something like that. Mad King or Mad Kingston eighty one on Twitter. Oh, there we go, Danny. Thank you. PR goes <laughs> at Mad King nineteen eighty one. I think that's my Instagram and Twitter or one of them. It's one of them, folks. All I do on Twitter is put up old wrestling matches, and I just retweet friends from the independents. That's all I do. You're not going to find anything crazy on it. That's all I do. Like, right now, I'm watching Mid-South Wrestling, so I just go, oh, and my IG is Eddie Kingston 81. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. <laughs> all right. Well, I guess, I guess, listen, it's a wrestling <laughs> perspective. Go subscribe wherever you find it. We, we don't care. And... Uh, <laughs> Look, we'll say our goodbyes off the air. For the rest of you guys, the show is over. Go home. Eddie Kingston, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. I appreciate y'all. For real. Thank you.